back in uh, the early 50s, I was well, in the middle, early middle 50s, I was doing uh, television commercials for Coca-Cola and Budweiser and, and designing a few commercials for uh, Jell-O and Sanka and a few others. And I had time off during a Budweiser contract. For two weeks, I'd have the time to devote completely to making this little film that I had done as a study under Slavko Borkovich. Uh, he was teaching, teaching me at USC in the early 50s. Uh, about uh, kinesthetic film principle, which revolutionized my whole outlook on filmmaking and, gave, and it gave energy to any type of filming I would do because of his, uh, his principles. I made this film called Gambasia. I wanted to do it with people, live action, but it was too expensive and too uh, time consuming, so we did it in miniature with clay. We could change the shapes and move them around and so on. So I decided to make it first <clears throat> as a study of effects of movement and shape and color on the nervous system through the eye cells that he was teaching us. And I did this uh, four-minute film called Gambasia. I showed that to, I was teaching a little later in uh, Studio City at uh, Harvard Military Academy then, it's now Harvard School. I was teaching uh, and tutoring a fellow in English who happened to have been the son of Sam Engel, who was a producer at 20th with Daryl Zanuck. He was producing films with Sophie Lauren and all the big stars, Loretta Young, Cary Grant, and so on. He had me bring it over to the studio, this little 16 millimeter color picture. He took me into this big projection studio. Uh, with, it looked like, a, looked like a theater. And it was just he and I and the projectionist back in the room. and. He saw it once, and then he got up and started pacing back in front while it, because he wanted to see it again. And they were rewinding, and he paced back and forth in front of the screen, and saying, Art, we, this is the most, here's a guy, who, he invented uh, Charlie Chan series, and then, of course, produced all these others, and he was making millions of dollars. I was making $150 a month teaching at the time. He says, Art, you and I have got to go into partnership. I've been wanting to improve. And then I, I had visions of working with people like Sophia Lauren, you know, making films, all the stars. Then he said, I want to improve the quality of television. So uh, can you make little characters out of that clay and have them move around in stories? And she said, yeah. So I, he had me go back. We formed a partnership. I went back and formed characters that would be practical. I had to work out the, the ballistics, you know, of, uh, of clay. They would melt under hot lights and they'd disintegrate as you animated them and they were hard to stand them up if they were too thin and so on. So we had to make, I made this very simple to duplicate character Gumby and then Pokey as the stars. So we could duplicate them very cheaply and very uh, rapidly. And that was the reason we made him that shape. I wanted to give the shape a little character, so I thought of uh, my father's picture on the wall where he had this big colic that amazed me as a five-year-old. And uh, it stuck in my memory, and it's, it stood out as unique. Ronald Reagan used to have a, a little bump like that, but not so pronounced. And so uh, I put that on Gumby as a bump. I found out later that in Buddhism, that's called the bump of wisdom, only it's usually in the middle, not in the side. <laughs> Instead of trying to remold him and reconstitute him, it'd be much faster just to have another one on a tray, mm -hmm. a tray of Gumbies we'd have beside us as we animated. Just set him in place in the middle of a movement. See, very easy to do. We didn't do replacement type of animation. I didn't like that, that was too mechanical. They did that in Europe a lot, still do, where they'd have, a, a, say, 24 faces and bodies. It, it, uh, it takes away from the life uniqueness of every movement. Because when you move and push clay, it takes a unique shape that well, you cannot duplicate. And uh, so it just flows and it, it's uh, full of surprises. And I think that's another thing, a key to the uh, appeal is that Gumby is full of surprises, mm -hmm. that kind of animation. It's not all mechanically planned. Of course, that was the basis for Gumby's appeal in the beginning as well, only it was for children, and the children sensed it, and, and parents, many parents did too, but uh, 
I call it trimensional animation, that uh, you play on the senses that pick up the 3D feeling, the concrete feeling. Uh, it's not abstract like cartoons. Cartoons are drawings that are flat and so on. People have a gut feeling reaction to not only this three-dimensional thing. I know you see puppet tunes of George Powell and from Europe, Lou Bunnan. It was Lou Bunnan's uh, Alice in Wonderland back in the 30s that inspired me. I was so fascinated. And then I saw, then I, then Disney's came out at the same time, and uh, I thought Bunnins was much more fascinating because of the three-dimensional aspect and the, uh, this fantasy, terrific fantasy of these things, three-dimensional things coming to life. And then I added clay with all the other things. We had Bunnin-type puppets and uh, real life, uh, real t miniature sets, but the clay was something special. It's another symbol, too. And I think the kids picked up on that from reactions we got in, in, sh in theaters across the country. That they really had emotional reactions to just this. They were frightened that Gumby was not going to get back into his original shape if he got out of shape. And that scared them. Or they, they got a thrill out of seeing a change into uh, a boat or change and flatten out into a puddle and so on. I realized then, I, I didn't realize this years ago when I was making it, but after getting in touch with the people that uh, loved Gumby and, and loved our creation, that the uh, true subconscious reaction was to the clay, and of course to the character, mm -hmm. but to the clay underneath the character, and that was symbolic of themselves, of their true self, their true nature, which is change. Our, we cha Gumby is a symbol <laughs> of our true selves. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Indians call it Atma, the basic soul self, but we are the same. We don't change, but yet we do change. See, Gumby is the same, but he changes. He appears to change, and yet in, in your mind, Gumby is still there. He's still the same, and he can, he can come back and show you that he's still the same shape. And that is amazing to me, because I think people pick up on that in their subconscious, that, that here is a basic truth about themselves that they are immortal, you might say. It tells the kids not to worry that if they get out of shape, <laughs> that uh, they can come back to, uh, they don't lose their real uh, character, their real uh, self, by going out of shape. If they grow from a little boy to a big boy and a big man, an old man, anything can happen to them to disfigure them and so on. And they can still be assured that uh, they're true nature and integrity is intact. I always did the voice for Pokey, except in, in all the, the first 80 or 90 films. They speeded it up. Dallas McKinnon did the voice for Gumby. Later on, they had a woman do Gumby's voice. In truth, only a child can make children's films. We can listen to children and see what kind of stories and films they would make and, and do it, but we can't really. Whatever an artist makes, he puts some of himself into it. And, and since I'm not a child anymore, I can put some of the child that I was into it, but also there would be some of the adult, you see. So uh, I hesitate to call any films that I make uh, children's films. Uh, say around six years of age, eight, eight to ten. Adults, uh, for the most part, wouldn't be interested in them. At least in those days, they didn't seem to be. Parents were interested in them because the, because the, just the change. That was one of the things I learned in kinesthetic film principles: is the the, the changing of things, not only just of changing the shapes of the clay, but the changing of the scenes, the cutting from scenes and the movements, the organizing the, to tell a story, is uh, that's an art in itself too, more than just the animation. See, that's what people forget, that, that is the cutting, and that's the ones that I didn't write, that's how they stand apart from mine so much, is that, is that mine will have, uh, say, every minute will have an average of... Um, well, a six-minute film would have 80 cuts, 80 scenes, whereas uh, someone else would normally write one with 30 
cuts, usually 30 to 40 cuts. So my number of scenes that I would make would be double, and not necessarily more expensive either. It just would be uh, manipulating the camera, just changing the camera angles and so on. There was uh, a lot of uh, stress. Uh, I had brought my wife into the business as a, my secretary. She took care of the books and the typing of letters and so on, while I handled the creative part and directing and so on. But uh, it got into a situation where I had to leave because uh, uh, while there was a lot of uh, conniving that went on with uh, a salesman who went into cahoots with her and the lawyer and uh, they, we had just had made a big deal with a big toy company and they all wanted to get their hands on that money and they were afraid I might push them out, you know, and, and so the salesman, uh, he was afraid I was going to fire him before he got this, a chunk of this, uh, the royalties set in a contract. So they all maneuvered to try to fool and, and deceive me and push me out. <clears throat> and it made it so unpleasant that I decided to just take a leave of absence and just leave the, the situation, uh, live off the royalties for a while, and uh, I went through all kinds of therapy as an adventure to become a better director. I was hoping to, people said it would increase your uh, creativity to uh, get in touch with feelings. And uh, so I tried out all kinds of these therapies and so on group therapy, etc. On coming back, I discovered that here these people were making all this money on Gumby and really not respecting Gumby. They didn't know what Gumby was all about. Uh, and so I've, in the last several years I've been trying to get back in, in the control of the thing and now we're just, we're just about in complete control of it now. Mm -hmm. We're just, uh, there's one contract that still has to be signed, which the lawyers are preparing. And that'll give me a complete uh, say so and how things are run. And, and uh, I'm starting my whole thing over again. You know, it's yeah. amazing. Uh, normally people would want, think of retiring at my age, but uh, I'm all excited about getting started on a new career. We have a, a script for a movie. I, I sat down and wrote this script and it was just inspiring. And it was more exciting than any Gumby script I've ever done. And it was a feature-length film, a uh, hundred minutes worth of uh, Gumby, instead of just six minutes. And uh, it has the benefit of all the therapy I went through, all the mind-expanding awareness uh, efforts, and uh, all the experiences I went through uh, with my children and my divorce. And that improved my creativity. It, it enriched me so that my creativity uh, creativity is enhanced. This business of senility is, has been overplayed in the past, and I suppose it is because of the poor diet of Americans. They, they suffered from senility. Nobody could have told me earlier. There's just no way of changing the past or telling you what to do, because uh, you, each person has a unique amount of awareness and you're going to do what you have to do. Have you covered the waterfront? Yeah, I think I have. The beginning, the first uh, three years, three or four years, I had a studio in, in Hollywood Mm -hmm. on Hudson Avenue in Santa Monica, Hudson and Santa Monica. And I had my own secretary. And Ruth, my wife, was busy. I uh, think she was home taking care of the baby or having a baby. Or So uh, when we moved out to Glendora, at that time, uh, the children were uh, getting to the point where she thought she could, uh, they were in school and she could uh, like to help out at the studio. So she could type and she was good at accounting, so she took that over the office there. 
he didn't have to hire anybody to be a secretary then. So uh, now Gary and I work very closely together on projects. We work on a film. We shot Mandala in the basement here. But then she has her other things she likes to do. And, but we both uh, get involved with Gumby. We both went on the tour together. We we're very fortunate we, that our jobs don't separate us. That is a problem when you're married and you have to go to work and if you're both working in separate work. Yeah, I'd, I'd had a, uh, a lot of interest in uh, the church and Spirit Christianity. And, but uh, it wasn't for me at that time. And then, after I made Gumby, after Gumby was on NBC, the Lutheran Church people saw it in New York, said, we'd want, we'd like to use that technique for our films, mm -hmm. teaching films for children to put on television. So they came out and asked me to, to do it. And so we did Davy and Goliath. I think they had in mind what these, these characters, the boy and the dog and the, the family, Mm -hmm. They wanted a family with a dog. And then we created the dog and the characters naturally, but they had an idea just generally what they wanted. And only Davy, he could only speak to Davy mm -hmm. and, and uh, only to the children. The parents don't understand the dog. <laughs> another reason uh, we could do it for such a low price, and that was another factor. We had to do it for a very low price. Mm -hmm. The uh, we were distributing them ourselves, uh, uh, and then Lakeside Toys came in and they helped us sell them. They'd go along with their salesmen and ours and make a deal, bribe the stations, because uh, children children's programs were a surfeit a surfeit amount. You know, it was too much. It was hard to get into stations because the big studios were giving away for to sweeten deals, they give a lot of uh, cartoons away out of their vaults. And so uh, the stations uh, had to be bribed. And then when they saw how popular Gumby was, many of them would write back asking for more. In fact, most of them did, they, they all wanted more. So, uh, there's a definite, what I call spatial hunger that we have. When you see a flat picture, you have a hunger for it to have depth. Uh, because you want it to be more like you. You're three-dimensional, so uh, when you're confronted with something flat, it kind of uh, reminds you, I think, of a wall, something that confines you, limits you, whereas three dimensions you can get around and get into. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the uh, appeals in Disney, I don't think. You see, he sensed it subconsciously, but he never realized that in his medium he could never achieve it. He tried to <laughs> by du duplicating all these walls, these planes, these mm -hmm. flat planes. And no number of flat planes can duplicate what we did. And then the movements, he tried to duplicate human movements. And, uh, made, the, made the Mickey Mouse, they had these little brisk movements, which were characteristic of Mickey and not of the human beings. And Pluto and so on. They had their own movements which was more filmic, but uh, mm -hmm. it's above and beyond reality. That's it.